Hi, I'm Bill Sproul. The Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters is committed to educating the public about critical economic issues that affect their daily lives. That is why we are proud to support important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters. Your future is in our building. The law firm of Gibbons PC. The Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. And by Seton Hall University. Come see what great minds can do. Promotional support provided by Meadowlands Chamber. Building connections, driving business growth. And by NJ Biz. All business, all New Jersey. State of Affairs, I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio in Newark, New Jersey. It is our honor once again to introduce Assemblywoman Nancy Munoz, a Republican from Union County, are you yes, not? Yes, Union County, Summit, New Jersey. Summit, the 21st Summit. Legislative yep. District. A nurse by profession? Yes. Oh, the only one in All, the... Lic only licensed registered nurse. Thank you for clarifying yeah. that. Yeah. You care about health care issues. We're going to get do. into that. I do. So one of the issues you're mm -hmm. very involved in is the fact that you've introduced two pieces of legislation, A, go check this out on our website, A1711 and A1651, two pieces of legislation creating a sexual assault victim's bill of rights. Explain it. Well, you know, it's the, it, obviously this is an important topic, and we've been discussing this a lot. I was on the ad hoc committee on domestic violence, and we did a lot of look into domestic violence. And this, this runs parallel to that, which is sexual assault. Obviously, we've been following the case uh, at the hiring of the S in the state government. Well, let's clarify for a second. The assemblywoman was on the committee um, special investigating the, special the, well, the Katie Brennan yeah. Listen, let's put it out yeah, there. The yeah. Katie Brennan case, you can read about it. You were there. You I was were there. asking questions. You were listening to testimony. Right, right. Did that influence what you're doing here? No, this was our, no, it didn't. But it, it supported what we're doing, which is to make sure that people, that everyone has equal access to, to um, therapy, to respect, to be believed and by law enforcement, by the prosecutor's office, and by healthcare professionals. So what we found is that, you know, sometimes a victim will go to the police station and they're not believed. And we have 10,000 reported sexual assaults per year in the state of New Jersey. And what we heard in testimony from this particular person, um, Katie Brennan, was that the police didn't actually believe her. Right. And this Bill of Rights says that you have to be believed. I mean, to, and you have to be believed even if you don't report to the police. You need to be entitled to the same offer of services. Just because you don't go to the police doesn't mean you shouldn't have a rape kit done or you can't get counseling services. You can't be offered a professional, um, an offer to get some mm. kind of therapy. Because, you know, people don't understand that trauma affects people differently. People expect that everyone reacts differently. Why do people cry at funerals or laugh at funerals? People expect you to cry. Different reactions. Different reactions and delayed reactions. So, so what does the legislation do? Does it change what? It changes that it simply states that every victim must be treated with respect. And that's what it says. And so we need to educate law enforcement. That's part of the process. And we've done that with domestic violence legislation. We need to do that to say, police officers, when you report, you need to believe that, that victim, whether it's a female, male, and not say, mm. yeah, right, it didn't happen, or it was your fault. We want to make sure that right. they don't say to the victim, did you, you know, where were you? Was it why was it? Did it happen at three o'clock in the morning? Were you drunk? Regardless of what the reason is, you, they have to be believed and therefore offered services. We're talking to Assemblywoman Nancy Munoz, who is engaged in a, a very aggressive effort to change some of the laws in our state regarding victims of sexual abuse. 
Uh, Jackie, help me on this again. Jackie wants us, and she's right, to talk about the confidentiality piece of this. Talk about it. The confidentiality piece um, extends, we have it now for victims of domestic violence, the address confidentiality, so that you, the, the per person who's looking for you can't find you. So you get to have a confidential address, usually a post office, and then the post office will send that that mail to your address, and it keeps you pri it allows you some privacy. Right. We've extended this to victims of of sexual assault, uh, to victims of stalking, and to, and even people who are looking mm -hmm. for a restraining order. I had a constituent um, who was being stalked, and the person found out where she had moved to by going into her parents' mailbox. Now that's wow. so that's this includes sexual assault, assault as well as 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 stalking and and restraining orders. Before I leave this uh, topic, Nancy, where are we right now with this? Is it moving through the legislature? They're both moving through the legislature. Do you have any word from Governor Murphy as to where he is on this? I have not, but I haven't heard. But I can't imagine that he wouldn't sign this. It's a common sense piece of legislation that makes sense, protects victims, and which is what we all want to do in the state of New Jersey. Let's shift gears. We're talking with Nancy uh, Munoz, uh, State Representative, 21st District. Um, let's try this. You have a medical background yes. as a licensed nurse. Can we talk about end-of-life issues uh, as we speak Absolutely. right now? Yes. Actually, Assemblyman John Bersicelli will be joining us on State of Affairs. He's a sponsor of legislation for seven years. He's been fighting for, some people call it physician-assisted suicide, but it is, in fact, an effort with someone with six months to live to yeah. get the assistance of a physician to help them die. Yes. Your late husband, uh, who was one of our family's closest friends, Dr. Eric Munoz, yes. Um, he and millions of other physicians work to save lives. There's an oath to save lives. Right. Is there an inherent, somehow a contradiction in this, in your mind? Yes, in my mind there is, and I voted no on the bill. You, you, so it passed both houses of the legislature. Yes. As we speak yes. on the 8th of uh, April. April. The 9th, I apologize. The governor has, he said he, I, we think he supports it, we don't know. If it gets passed into law, what would it mean for millions of physicians? Well, you know, as you also know that I have a son in, that's right. in healthcare, and right. I spoke to him about this, and he said, well, that's fine, but I'm not doing it. So I do know that they do it in other states, and there are physicians who will agree to do this. My, I have many concerns. One of my concerns is that the people who, in my view, as my career in healthcare, that could most benefit from this, people with ALS maybe, who are... Um, or somebody with dementia who just doesn't want to go on. You have to be able to self-administer the drug. Yes. And you also have to be mentally competent to make the determination. And we have done a great deal of work in palliative care, in hospice care, in making our patients comfortable and determining right. the end of their lives, what we can give them to make them comfortable, whether it's, you know, um, it's palliative care, anti-anxiety, anti pain medications, effective pain medications, and allow the patient to die at home. This bill requires the prescription to be written and the patient to bring it home and self-administer. Now, you bring a lethal dose of a drug home, Who's to say that somebody else doesn't accidentally take the drug? It's that's a, one of the worries. So but the my safeguards worry is, you're looking for the safeguards, but I'm also looking for expansion of palliative care. You know, we are really two seconds left. Go ahead. We're looking to make people comfortable to end their lives in the way that they want to end them. But I want to do it that is consistent with our 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 oath as healthcare providers to to do no harm and to make people comfortable and allow them to die at home. A few seconds. The POLST, P-O-L-S-T, stands for? for? Practitioner Order for Life Sustaining Treatment. It allows a, a person to determine in their own words how they want the end-of-life treatment to go. My mother has one at my house. It says, I don't want chest compressions. I don't want to be intubated. If I go into failure, you can give me Lasix or don't give me Lasix. You determine. Practitioner Order, because not only physicians, but advanced practice nurses and PAs can sign the, can sign the form. You've been listening to State Assembly woman Nancy Munoz from the 21st, 21st Legislative District. I want to thank you for joining us on State thank of you. Affairs. Thank you so Come much. Come back anytime. Stay I appreciate right it. There. Thank you. I'm Steve Arabato. This is State of Affairs, and we will be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Arabato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the North Ward Center in Newark, New Jersey, part of a, a conversation we're having, a series we're doing 
on autism. It's called a different way of thinking. We're honored to be joined once again. Uh, he's been with us many times, Dr. Sharif Elnahal, Commissioner of the Department of Health in New Jersey. Good to see you, Commissioner. Thank you, Steve. The role of the department, the role of the state when it comes to helping those dealing with the autism challenge is? It's a really important topic, Steve, and I appreciate you bringing uh, the, these group of folks together who focus on it. Uh, New Jersey is one of the states that has among the highest autism rates in the country. One in 34 children in New Jersey are diagnosed with autism. A part of that is because we have systems in place that actually allow us to diagnose it more reliably than a lot of other states. Uh, but we have to do something about it. And so uh, we have a lot of services at the state level that allow us to do that. Uh, broadly speaking, autism is a condition uh, of social functioning, uh, delay in uh, normal social behavior that you would expect from a child. And we have systems in place that allow us to detect that earlier than most states in New Jersey. So let me ask you, we, we have one of our guests, by the way, uh, the commissioner is joining us on a 10-person panel discussion here at the North Ward Center uh, talking about this issue. And one of your colleagues uh, from up at Montclair State, you'll meet her, Dr. Catalano, who said it's a good thing on some level that New Jersey diagnoses um, at a higher rate than other states because? Well, the earlier you detect autism, the more you can do about it. And very importantly, the more you can support the families that have children with autism. What do they need? So they need a lot of support and understanding, number one, uh, how to uh, deal with behavioral changes in their child and allow them to thrive uh, and be as successful as they can be in school, uh, because all of that matters in terms of their education, in terms of their ability to transition into adulthood. And so the earlier you know, the earlier you can get that uh, child the right services. And luckily, New Jersey has programs in place that allow for that. So we have the early intervention system, uh, for example, that provides families with support that they need uh, to help children transition. What is the early transition. intervention system? The early intervention system is actually a system of services where uh, the Department of Health, uh, our department, provides funding uh, to provider agencies across the state that actually go into uh, homes across New Jersey and assist families with children uh, who have autism. What age are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about as early as two years old. So early as two. You can detect so, autism. Ahead, I'm sorry. You can detect autism as early as two. Uh, these services can actually be provided at age one or older. Uh, so over 50% of children in our autism registry, we're only one of eight states, by the way, that has a registry, which is good news because we can uh, do a lot of good research with that, uh, have, been, uh, have gotten services in our early mm -hmm. intervention system. It's interesting you mentioned the early intervention system. The other time, last time you joined us, I believe in our series, State of Affairs, I talked to you about one of our other initiatives called Right from the Start NJ, dealing with uh, birth to three challenges that, that, that our infants and toddlers have. Infants and toddlers who are dealing with or, or struggling with autism, part of that discussion. Absolutely. So the early intervention system is for any type of developmental disability. So like you said, it can start at birth when there is a recognition that a child has a disability. Uh, but what the early intervention system allows for is to alert providers, pediatricians, uh, the healthcare system, uh, that a child may have autism uh, as they continue their services. And so that's one of many reasons why we're able to detect autism on average uh, at a younger age than most states. Our average is about four years old four. Uh, for detecting autism, which is earlier than the vast majority of states. Commissioner, fast forward. The whole question of aging out, but is it 21? Is that the age? Yeah. What is the difference between how the state sees its responsibility, particularly your department? I know there are other state departments that are part of this complex mix of services on a state level. But here's the question. What changes at 21 for someone struggling dealing with autism in terms of what the state provides or doesn't? Yeah, the biggest issue is that we're, there's a whole host of services that have been built over decades. Advocacy groups have been on the ground, uh, Autism New Jersey uh, and so many others uh, that have provided services to children throughout the years. Because we're getting better at treating autism and providing services for children with autism, more of them are able to transition into adulthood. And so uh, people often speak of a cliff, falling off a cliff of services available at once 21? people reach the age of 21. Now, New Jersey is different in the sense that uh, that's been anticipated, and the New Jersey Department of Human Services in particular has an office of autism uh, that is providing unprecedented services for people transitioning into adulthood. So that's my colleague, Carol Johnson, and her the department. commissioner. 
Yeah, and Commissioner in, Johnson. In the governor's cabinet. Exactly. Uh, and the other thing is our advocacy organizations have already thought about this and are doing great work. Autism New Jersey in particular, I know that Suzanne Buchanan mm -hmm. will be in our panel She's part of uh, coming up, uh, has uh, come up with a really great training program uh, that involves parents, it involves uh, advocacy organizations, case management agencies, uh, and providers, bringing them together, teaching best practices, and helping people transition into adulthood who have autism. Let me ask you this, Commissioner. Because you also have a clinical background, and you've dealt with families, dealing with all kinds of difficult, challenging clinical medical issues, health issues, what I'm curious about is public attitudes about not only a 12-year-old on the autism spectrum, but his or her family. <laughs> to what degree do you believe societal attitudes, I've asked this of a lot of guests, to what degree do you believe societal attitudes toward those dealing with autism and their family members has in any way evolved or changed? I think it's evolving in a positive direction, Steve, but there are a lot, there's a lot of room to grow. Uh, first and foremost, awareness about the issue, uh, programs like this, panels like the one that's coming up, are really important because people uh, need to be aware that children with autism uh, are being diagnosed more frequently, that uh, their child may have a classmate with autism, and uh, behavioral uh, changes may be noticed in friends and family uh, so that not only people would be able to detect it in their own families, uh, but they can be sympathetic and understand when another child with autism uh, comes into their life in one way or the other. So it's really important. Doctor, are you an advocate of children with autism being in a classroom with other children who are not on the autism spectrum? So ch children with autism do need specialized services. It's why we have the early intervention system. It's why we have great case management services in every county in New Jersey. As much as possible, we do try to insert uh, with the right services uh, children with autism in as many common environments as possible. And so if they can thrive in a classroom, they should be in a classroom with other students uh, who may not have autism. But all of that is individualized because uh, autism is a spectrum. The DSM-5, which is the most recent diagnostic Explain manual. That. DSM is diagnostic. It's a diagnostic manual for psychiatric uh, disorders and developmental disorders. So the term, the autism spectrum, break it down in layperson's language. Absolutely. So a spectrum is basically a gradient from, uh, you know, not as severe to severe. And uh, there used to be classified into three different categories of autism. Now it's considered one spectrum because of so much variation you see in patients. Uh, but the most mild forms of the autism spectrum can be diagnosed as late as seven or eight years old because the symptoms are more mild. Uh, when you get into the more severe, you often diagnose it earlier because changes are noticed earlier by family and by mm. physicians and providers. Uh, so the idea is that uh, every child is uh, their own child. They're individuals. Uh, and they have their own um, you know, characteristics in terms of the disease. So we really have to cater uh, our services and our thinking in a much more individualized basis. Commissioner, we appreciate not just this one-on-one -on -one in-depth interview with you, but also the fact that you're joining this very prestigious and distinguished panel talking about autism, um, a different way of thinking. The fact that we're thinking at all and talking about it is important. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Appreciate it, Steve. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. State of Affairs is joined by Assemblyman John Bersicelli, who is the Deputy Speaker of the House. Good to see you, Assemblyman. Happy to be here. All the way up from South Jersey, we greatly appreciate it. You have been a leader for almost seven years in this legislation called the Aid in Dying for the Terminally Ill. Terminally Ill. Um, as we tape this program on April 9th, there's a good chance by the time this airs, this will be a law that the governors may sign. Hopefully. What will it do? Well, it'll give people who are terminally ill with a dual diagnosis of six months or less to live the option of requesting from their physician a prescription that they can fill uh, that will allow them to conclude their life uh, when they choose to, because it has to be self-administered. You know, we had a assemblywoman, Nancy Munoz, who voted against it here, a nurse who said, you know what? There are people who can't administer it because they have dementia, they're sick, they have That's a certain... So then what? 
Well, there, there, are, there are limitations because in this approach, a person has to be of sound mind at the time they request a prescription and has to be able to self-administer the pharmaceutical. The idea is self-determination and control. So this is not Dr. Kravorkian. Someone doesn't show up and inject you with something. This is your decision, and that's how it's structured. So, man, you talked to us, but my, my colleague at uh, WNET, Rafael P. Roman, you joined us many times and talked about this. This is a fight you've been involved in. I've always been curious, seven years, why so committed? Is this personal? No, actually, it bubbled up through, uh, through staff. Uh, I took an interest in it after mm -hmm. researching, and uh, it's just become a, 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 I always thought it was a place the legislature should spend time with. And this kind of issue is not an arm-twisting, political kind of horse trading for votes type thing. So it took a while to bring people long enough to be satisfied. that The Assembly passed it three times, finally passed the Senate this time around. And this governor uh, has said he's going to sign it. The previous governor was not inclined to do so. So uh, it just took time. Safeguards. There are physicians, some physicians, who say, you know what, um, I'm not going to... Because the physician has to... Two physicians have to sign off? That's correct. If a physician says, I don't want to be a part of this, he or she can do that, correct? That's correct. Uh, and as well as any kind of uh, facility. So if you're at a Catholic hospital, it's not a service, not a service you're going to be asking for and expecting to get. They're exempted and there's no liability for not being willing to do it. They're part of the, they're part of the safeguards. This is a national issue. In fact, New Jersey, when this happens, when and if it happens again, there's a good chance this will be a law by the time this airs, would be the seventh state. Eight state? Eight state. Eight state, including the District of Columbia. Do you see this as a national movement that will gain steam after this? It, it feels like it is, but I don't think this choice will ever be mainstream. Our experience looking at Oregon, which we study very closely, tells us this is not the first choice of people. And in fact, of the 300, around 300 people in 2017 that asked for the prescription in Oregon, less than half of them used it. It seems to be a vehicle of comfort for people, knowing that they have this choice to marry into other palliative care, hospice, the wonderful work all those people do. It just seems, again, that it provides uh, a point of comfort, that you know you're mm -hmm. in control of your circumstances. You know, it's interesting. I was at a conference where a, a very prominent um, nun, a woman uh, of faith in my church, Catholic Church, gave a speech on this. And she said the whole idea of pain is not as relevant in trying to relieve pain for someone. It's not as relevant as it was just a few years ago because of technology. And there are very few, if any, people who die in pain, you say? Well, it simply isn't true. And by the way, I'm raised a Catholic. My aunt is a, is a sister of mercy. So I understand all the discussion back and forth. It's never been my role as a legislator to convince anyone that this should be their choice. My, my tack here was always where should the law be. And uh, that was decided by both the legislature that the law should allow this choice for people who want to make it. Those who don't want to make this choice, this law changes Go nothing for them. Go back to the them. pain thing. What makes, what makes you convinced that people are dying, significant number of people are dying in pain? Well, clearly... With all the technology. Uh, well, uh, other than at that moment when a person is slipped into a, a morphine coma, uh, pain is very real. Testimony was considerable across the state that there are a number of people that, that find great concern about the pain that they think they will face. If they, think, if they think that will come, that's part of the equation of why they may want to consider a choice like this. But again, for those who are against this, Steve, nothing changes for them. They're not going to make this choice. Sure. You know, New Jersey, in the last 30 days of life, New Jersey is the most expensive state in the nation in terms of health care costs, right? Could be. I mean, no, no, it, it is. It, well, it's, could no, it's be. a factor. Yeah. Here's what I'm yeah. trying to get to. It, it didn't factor into our discussions. It did not. It did not factor into our discussions. Because there are some who believe that part of this is the effort to reduce health care costs by having those who are terminally ill not st stay alive longer. The, the facts you never raised this. Never raised it, and well, it's been raised by the opposition. No, not by you, though. Yeah, yeah, the, facts, the facts don't bear that out. We looked at it very carefully. And in fact, the legislation is very clear that this kind of prescription cannot be put in place Describe of medication. The, I'm sorry for interrupting you, Senator. Uh, by the way, if you're listening on the audio side, John Bersicelli is the Deputy Speaker of the House in the Assembly. For seven years, he's been fighting for this effort to help people who are terminally ill uh, make that choice. Uh, pick up your point. My point was that in the legislation, uh, a, this, this choice of this prescription cannot be used in place of medication or therapy. The person has to make, it, has to make a choice to ask for this. So an insurance company, by law, can't say, well, by the way, we're not going to cover that, but we will cover this if you will do this. Uh, that would be illegal, and there would be a hefty fine. Are you confident that... <sighs> I, the, the prescription that helps someone pass 
The other argument, and again, my job here is to raise the issues of those who are questioning it, is that it may not work. Well, Steve, I mean, uh, if you're terminally ill and you're in the home stretch and you're greatly weakened, I would say the odds of it working are very high. Would there be circumstances? I guess there could be always outlying circumstances. Again, all the information we have from other states does not tell us that. Time we have left. Have you gotten pushback from the Catholic Church? I've had wonderful discussions with the Catholic Church. Really? I had long discussions with a number of representatives. Leaders? Free, free discussions, which I've welcomed, learned the details of Catholic hospice, and it told me the Catholic Church uh, allows people of our faith to make choices not to eat, to, to decline medication, even though it will hasten your demise. But this is not something the Catholic Church will advocate for. Nothing will change for them uh, in Catholic teaching. They won't, they won't counsel... Or Catholic hospitals. Or Catholic hospitals, because they'll be exempted. But they won't, they won't, they won't counsel to their, their, their flock that they should make this choice. Nothing changes for them. This will be for those who want to make this choice. That was the question of where the law should be, and that's been decided. John Bersicelli, Assemblyman John Bersicelli, all the way from South Jersey. What towns are you at? What Paulsboro. community? Paulsboro. Paulsboro. Gloucester County. Came all the way up to Newark. He's a Deputy Speaker of the Assembly and, and uh, in very important discussion. Thank you, Assemblyman. Stay you, right Steve. there. Appreciate it, brother. Uh, that's it for this edition of State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. Let's continue the conversation and follow me on Twitter, please. It's at Steve Adubato. See you next week. Thank you. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters, the law firm of Gibbons PC, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, New Jersey Sharing Network, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, Choose New Jersey, Seton Hall University, and by these public-spirited organizations, individuals, and associations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the important issues facing the Garden State, and by Employers Association of New Jersey. What can great minds do? While at Seton Hall, I interned with the Superior Court of New Jersey, and that inspired me to go to law school. I am a physics and civil engineering major, and I want to work on infrastructure in underdeveloped countries. I'm the news director at one of the top college radio stations in the country. I'm working with my professor on research that could help athletes during sudden cardiac events. I started my own business, Classic Soccer Cleats, and I just sold it to a company in England. Come see for yourself what great minds can do.